In this and the next few lectures, we are going to study the second law of thermodynamics. Till now, we've seen that the first law of thermodynamics is the principle of conservation of energy for thermodynamic systems. For a system that undergoes a transformation or a process, let's say from state 1 to state 2, we know that the first law that is for a closed system delta E is equal to Q plus W. This first law cannot be violated. However, this doesn't mean that the transformation of a system that obeys the first law of thermodynamics can actually occur. So it may happen that you may able to go from state 1 to state 2 and you might not be able to go from state 2 to state 1 even though the first law is still applicable. A simple example of this scenario is a hot cup of tea. So if you have a hot cup of tea, so this cup is going to lose heat to the surroundings and the tea is going to cool down. However, the reverse process that this tea picks up heat from the surroundings and it gets heated up is not possible. So even though the first law does not prohibit such a process to occur. Similarly, we know from everyday experience that there are certain processes that do occur and certain processes that do not occur. And we know this from everyday experience. Now, let us consider certain examples that we have used earlier to illustrate the first law of thermodynamics. And we'll see that there are certain processes that occur and certain processes that do not occur. So the first example is that that is similar to the Joules experiment. So we have a tank whose walls are insulated and this tank is provided with a paddle wheel which is rotated by this weight that can move up and down through this pulley. Now this tank is filled with a fluid. Now consider that this weight lowers down and in the process it rotates this paddle wheel and the paddle wheel rotates and eventually a new equilibrium state of the fluid is attained. So in this case, this is our system. The fluid is the system that we are interested in. So this system attains a new equilibrium state. And in this new equilibrium state, the fluid will have higher temperature or more specifically, it would have higher internal energy and that's because we have done work on the system and the amount of work that has been done is equal to the change in potential energy of this weight. Now if you consider the reverse process so we now know that as the weight goes down the internal energy of this fluid let's say u2 is greater than its initial internal energy. And this U2 minus U1 is equal to the work that we have done on the system. And, and don't confuse this with uh, W with work. This is the weight. So the change in internal energy as we go from the first state to the second state is equal to the work that is done on the system. Now consider the reverse process. Now consider that this uh, internal energy of the gas goes back to its initial state. So we say U1 minus U2. So you go from state 2 back to state 1. And we say that can we have a situation where the internal energy of the gas decreases and this mass goes back to its original position. That is, this is the change in 
the potential energy of the mass or we can say that the change in internal energy causes this weight to rise up. Now clearly this process that is going from state 1 to state 2 is practically feasible and we know that from our past experience. However, the reverse process that the fluid cools down or its internal energy decreases and in the process it lifts up the weight is not practically possible. But the first law does not prohibit us from such a process because the first law is equally applicable for the forward and the reverse process. So that is the reason we need to have another law which tells us in which direction the process would proceed. Similarly, let's consider another system that we have seen earlier during the discussion of the first law. So now consider a battery and these are the positive and the negative terminals of the battery and this battery is short circuited by a resistor. As a result the current flows through this resistor and if you consider this whole system that is resistor and the battery combined as the thermodynamic system then there is heat transfer from this system to the surroundings and this heat transfer from the system to the surroundings comes at the expense of the decrease in internal energy of the battery. So uh, let's say that the system goes from state 1 to state 2. So u2 minus u1. So let's call this is the magnitude of the heat that is transferred from the system to the surroundings is equal to minus q and this is the decrease in internal energy. So the heat that is transferred from the system to the surroundings comes at the expense of the internal energy and that comes from the first law. Now we'll have the same system but can we think of a process where we add this much amount of heat and it would result in charging of the battery. So we cannot have a process where we add this heat Q and that results in charging of the battery even though the first law is equally applicable for that forward and the reverse process. So these two systems, this system for the Joule's experiment and this system for the battery, these two systems are completely different. However, can we say some uh, things that are similar to both of these systems? Now in each case we can identify the cause of the process and also predict the transformation of the system. What do we mean by this? We can predict in which direction this process is going to proceed. So to predict whether the forward or the reverse process is possible is obvious in both of these cases because these processes are connected to our experience. So we can rely on previous experience to predict what will happen. However, difficulty arises when we need to predict whether certain process is feasible or not in a situation that has no connection with our past experience. To illustrate this, consider a device which has one inlet and two exits and this is an open system. So a person claims that this device takes in compressed air from the inlet and from the exit it splits this compressed air into two streams one having a higher temperature and other having a lower temperature that means you feed in compressed air let's say at room temperature and this device 
splits it into two streams that is hot air and cold air streams and later on we'll see that and certainly such a device exists but many of you would not have seen such a device earlier now the person who has this device does not provide us with any details on the internal mechanism of the device and he says that there is no heat transfer to this device and there is let's say no work that is done on this device and uh, let's consider a steady state operation where the compressed air flows in and it splits up into a hot air stream and a cold air stream now is there a way to tell whether such a process can take place in the direction that is claimed by this person who has this device to answer such questions one need to generalize the results of our past experiences with simple processes what do we mean by this statement is that we know in which direction simple processes such as the one that we've seen previously will proceed and using such simple processes can we generalize the results so that we can apply to different kind of systems and we've already seen three different systems so this is one of the system where we want to have a general result by which we can say whether such a process is feasible or not and we should be able to tell whether this process of the joules experiment or discharging of the battery to generate heat in which direction such processes can proceed so this kind of generalization is provided by the second law of thermodynamics and this generalization that the second law provides us is in a way that the direction of different types of processes can be predicted using a common principle and that principle is given by the second law now these examples that we have considered till now are only those processes where a system evolves from one state to a different state but similar things can be said about cyclic processes where the system returns to its original state so to look at cyclic processes we can again consider this example of this tank that is stirred with this paddle wheel now this time we will consider this system of the fluid that is contained within the tank to undergo a cycle so the first process is that let's say this system is at state 1 and that state it has lower temperature or lower internal energy then this weight goes down and in process the paddle wheel rotates and does work on the system and the system evolves to a state where it has higher temperature or higher internal energy now thereafter let's consider a process where we remove part of this insulation and then the system loses heat to the surroundings so that it returns back to its original temperature or internal energy therefore the system started from state 1 evolved to state 2 during this lowering of the weight and heating up the fluid and then this hot fluid will transfer heat to the surroundings and return back to its original state and recall that our system is only this fluid within the tank so we know from our experience that such a cyclic process where this system is first heated by doing work on the system and then it cools down by letting heat to be transferred to the surroundings is 
practically possible. However, let's look at the reverse process. So the reverse process is that, let's say we supply heat to this fluid and therefore its internal energy increases and the system is in state 2. So it has higher temperature and higher internal energy. Then we'll say that let's insulate the walls of this system so that there's no heat transfer with the surroundings and then because this system has now higher internal energy then at the expense of the decrease in internal energy we can say that can we think of a process where now the internal energy of the gas goes down so that the system goes from state 2 to state 1 and in the process this weight is raised. Clearly such a process is not possible and therefore this reverse process or reverse cyclic process is also not possible. In other words if you look at this cyclic process carefully so here we have a system which is operating in a cycle let's say if we can depict it on the diagram let's say we have p versus t diagram then in the forward process or that means in the process where the system goes from state 1 to 2 and goes back from state 2 to 1 what we have done is that the system takes in work so work is done on the system and in the cyclic process heat is rejected to the surroundings so in the whole process the system consumes work and rejects heat to the surroundings but in the reverse process where there is net heat transfer to the system and the system does work on the surroundings in this particular process does not appear to be feasible now the cyclic process in either direction does not violate the first law but there's only one direction in which this cyclic process can proceed so to describe what kind of processes can practically occur or they are feasible we not only need to know the first law of thermodynamics so we certainly need the first law of thermodynamics because a process cannot violate the principle of conservation of energy but that is not enough we also need another law that is the second law to also tell that if a process which might be a system evolving from one state to the other or it is a cyclic process if it is possible and if it is obeying the principle of conservation of energy then whether it is feasible or not to explain or to find out that we need to have the second law of thermodynamics in the next lecture what uh, we are going to do is we are going to look at a similar cyclic process and we are going to look at a system which also takes in heat and net heat transfer is to the system but it will do net work on the surroundings and such systems are called heat engines but we will see that there are certain limitations to the operation of such heat engines and we'll look at a related concept of operation of a refrigerator or a heat pump and once we have uh, looked at the heat pumps and uh, refrigerators and the heat engine then uh, we'll get further motivation to study the second law and then we are going to introduce the second law of thermodynamics so in the next lecture we'll continue this discussion with a focus on heat engines and refrigerators so as to motivate the need for the second law of thermodynamics.